Chapter 13 The Triassic Explosion, 252-200 MA One of the great joys of academics is the sense of community among the faculty, be it a community college or the most high-powered research institute in the land. Much of this comes from the very nature of the American university system, which requires a six- or seven-year trial period, followed by tenure. Permanence Perhaps more than in any other profession, university faculties have a high stability, and compared to most other professions, a relatively low rate of turnover. The result is that relationships can literally last for appreciable parts of one's lifetime. In this, the university faculty systems are indeed much like the system they were spawned from, the cloistered seminaries where monks would start as young men and then pass through life with others of their kind. And, as was true in the old abbeys, with age and wisdom one learns to respect those with even greater experience and listen to them. In the year 2000 or thereabouts, the authors of this book were at lunch with several of the eldest of the science faculty of the California Institute of Technology. One of these elder statesmen was the great Sam Epstein, one of the most distinguished professors of geochemistry, perhaps of all time. Sam was president in the halcyon days at the University of Chicago, when Nobel laureate chemist Harold Urey discovered a way to measure the temperature at which ancient carbonate rocks were formed by comparing the isotopes of oxygen found in the precipitated carbonate rock. The ratio of the isotope O16 varied with the much more rare isotope O18 in proportion to the temperature of formation. Sam eventually moved to Caltech and spent his career making high-precision measurements of many kinds of samples, using many different methodologies. But his first love seemed to be ancient temperatures. After a wonderful lunch, he took Kirschvink and Ward to his downstairs lab, which was in the process of being dismantled. The geochemical equipment of the 1950s and 1960s, Sam's heyday, was mainly composed of handmade and hand-blown glassware, walls of thin tubes spiraling, crisscrossing, making spider webs of glass interrupted by strange flask-like shapes, rubber tubing coming and going greased glass stopcocks of exquisite manufacture, everything custom-made by the artisans who kept science in those days going, the skilled technicians now banished by budget cuts and the new generations of solid-state technology. We walked through the lab and conversation moved on to a topic then of our keen interest, the Permian mass extinction and its possible causes. At that moment, the impact hypothesis was still viewed as the probable cause. Sam, however, would have none of it. He turned to us with a smile and told us the following short story. In his younger days, he had taken samples of marine limestone that dated to the earliest Triassic, samples that had probably been formed in a very shallow seaway somewhere near the Permian equator in what is now Iran. On a whim, or because that is what he loved most, Sam began analyzing these samples for their ancient temperatures. He was stunned, he said, to find that all had been formed in temperatures above 40 degrees Celsius, with some of the temperatures exceeding 50 degrees Celsius, from 104 degrees Fahrenheit to over 120 degrees Fahrenheit. The samples had come from ancient corals, creatures that need water of normal salinity. Such temperatures can be found in the stagnant pools and lagoons, but brachiopods do not live in such places. The temperatures found by Sam Epstein could not have been formed anywhere on our Earth. They spoke of a post-extinction world of unreal water temperature in the main ocean. Sam, then in his eighties, and with only another year ultimately to live, smiled a sad smile. He told us that he never had the guts to publish these data. Any paleo-temperature analysis requires really pristine samples to be accurate, and quite often, samples looking as if they had not been reheated, or exposed to groundwater, or chemically changed in any obvious way, had in fact had their oxygen isotope temperatures reset, and such resets were normally to produce what looked like abnormally high temperatures. This process becomes ever more common the older the sample but Sam was quite convinced that he had proof of ocean water temperatures above 100 degrees Fahrenheit in the first million years after the Permian extinction, 
in the first million years of the Triassic. Several years later, in analyzing paleo temperatures from a different lower Triassic site, we too found what looked like 100 degree plus water. This time, the depth was even greater than the estimated ancient water depths where Sam Epstein's Triassic brachiopods had grown so long ago. Like Sam Epstein, we did not publish these results. The prize never goes to the faint of heart. In 2012, a joint Chinese-American research team, trying to understand why it took so long for life to recover in the seas after the Permian extinction, published an amazing paper. Their findings? Water temperature of 104 degrees Fahrenheit in the sea and a blistering 140 degrees Fahrenheit on land. Unlike the work of Epstein, this study involved the analysis of over 15,000 samples, making it the most detailed and painstaking look yet at the environmental conditions in the aftermath of the Permian extinction. The scientists completing this study allowed themselves to speculate about what that ancient hot world would have been like. Most marine organisms die above the plus 100 degree Fahrenheit level found by the investigators. In fact, photosynthesis essentially stops at temperatures much above this. In that world, the entire zone of the tropics would have been devoid of animals, and complex life would have hung on only at high latitudes. Land animals would have been rare, even in the mid-latitudes. In such heat, there would have been enormous volumes of moisture in the air, and the tropics would have been wet year-round. But it might have been a wet desert with no plant life at all. Even better geochronology now shows that this time of high temperature extended at least for the first three million years of the Triassic, and indeed may have been climbing ever higher during that time, with a maximum temperature occurring during a time interval known as the Smithian stage, a million-year time interval of around 247 million years ago, having the highest of all known temperatures since the time when animals first occurred. Sam Epstein was right. Our data from Opal Creek were right. We were wrong in not publishing those data. The Permian extinction was clearly one of the most fundamentally catastrophic of all events, if, that is, one was a multicellular plant or animal. From a microbe's point of view, especially one of the sulfur-loving, oxygen-hating microbes that made up the majority of all life on Earth from its very inception right up to the first evolution of animals, that event was like a return to paradise. Seen from our vantage point so long after, the Permian extinction was a repeat of what happened at the end of the Devonian, itself the first of what we now call greenhouse extinctions. Many more were destined to come at the end of the Triassic, multiple times in the Jurassic and Cretaceous, and ending with the last known greenhouse extinction at the end of the Paleocene epoch some 60 million years ago. But none were ever to be so great as the Permian event, or to unleash a more diverse assemblage of animals in the aftermath of extinction. The Permian extinction gave the world many new creatures, but for us, two entirely new lineages, both thriving and evolving by the end Triassic period. In no small way, the Permian extinction brought to life mammals, and brought about the means that would create our long-term nemesis, the dinosaurs. Yet while being among the most important of all land animals, few animal groups are awarded an age of before their names, the Triassic dinosaurs and mammals were late arrivals in the Triassic explosion, and remained both relatively small of stature, especially the mammals, which rarely exceeded rat size, and small in both absolute abundance and species diversity. The age of dinosaurs was not to start until the successive Jurassic period, while the still-running age of mammals had to await the Cenozoic era. Long before the late Triassic arrival on the evolutionary stage of dinosaurs and mammals, the other animals and plants of the Triassic period make up a most interesting assemblage of organismal characters, cast with new versions of already long-running taxa, mixed with entirely new entrants, new designs arising, yet radically different from the actual survivors of the Paleozoic era. It is this mix that makes the Triassic appear to be a veritable crossroads in time. In some ways, it was not unlike the Cambrian explosion, a slew of newly invented body plans filling up an empty world, just as the first animals rapidly evolved into the cornucopia of body plans that filled the seas after the extinction of the first animals, the Ediacarans. And like the great Cambrian explosion, 
many of the body plans of novelty turned out to be but short-term experiments, to be pushed into extinction by the competition and or predation of better designed organisms. There is no time period other than the Cambrian and Triassic in which such a diversity of new forms appeared. Two reasons seem paramount. The Permian extinction emptied the world to such a degree that virtually any new design would work, for a while at least. But there is a second new view of the Triassic that may be just as or more important than this. Just coming out of the most devastating of all mass extinctions, the early Triassic world was very, very empty of life. At the same time, all modeling suggests that a long interval of the Triassic was a time of oxygen levels lower than those today. Earlier, we suggested that times of low oxygen, especially following mass extinction, foster disparity, the diversity of new body plans. These two factors combined to create the largest number of new body plans seen since the Cambrian, and here we propose that it is to that seminal Cambrian time that we most accurately compare the Triassic. We call this time and its biotic consequences the Triassic Explosion. The Triassic was a time of amazing disparity on land and in the sea. In the latter, new stocks of bivalve mollusks took the place of the many extinct brachiopods, while the great diversification of ammonoids and nautiloids refilled the oceans with active predators. Fully a quarter of all the ammonites that ever lived have been found in Triassic rocks, a time interval that is only 10% of their total time existence on Earth. The oceans filled with their kind, in shapes and patterns completely new compared to their Paleozoic ancestors. And why not? For, as shown earlier, this kind of animal was the preeminent, low-oxygen adaptation among all invertebrates. A new kind of coral, the Sclerectinians, began to build reefs, and many land reptiles returned to the sea. But it is on land that the most sweeping changes in terms of body plan replacements and body plan experimentation took place. Never before, and never since, has the world seen such a diverse group of different anatomies on land. Some were familiar Permian types. The therapsids that survived the Permian extinction diversified and competed with archosaurs for dominance of the land early in the Triassic, but this ascendance was short-lived. The many kinds of reptiles were locked in a competitive struggle with them and with each other for land dominance. From mammal-like reptiles to lizards, earliest mammals to true, the Triassic was a huge experiment in animal design. On the face of it, the mammals should have come out competitively ahead of the pure reptiles. After all, most of the mammal-like reptiles by this time were warm-blooded, probably capable, as now, of far more parental care than the presumably egg-laying dinosaurs. The mammalian teeth, one of the main reasons that mammals eventually did dominate the world, in their endlessly malleable tooth morphologies, allowed all kinds of food acquisition, from small seeds to grass to meat of many kinds, yet they did not win. Their extinction closed out the first age of mammals and gave rise to the second, composed of a very different group of mammals. One of the major changes that has and continues to allow entirely new kinds of study of all groups of extinct animals is the great revolution in communication, morphological characterization and image analysis, and profound literature search skills that the computer revolution has allowed. Now, large databases can be produced and then searched and analyzed in lightning blazes of microprocessor skill. No longer does each fossil have to be laboriously measured by hand with micrometers, and no longer is it a single investigator traveling from museum to museum to do the work. Almost every new study that brings change to our history of life comes from large teams of investigators, ultimately inputting huge numbers of numbers to be crunched. Now the machines do much of this for us, and the results can produce new insights. One such study by paleontologists Roland Sukias and Ludwig Maximilian of the University of Munich looked at the sizes of Triassic vertebrates that lived on land. In this and subsequent work by this group, it was found that only two major body plans emerged in the early Triassic amid the emptiness left behind by the Permian mass extinction. Those with four legs, quadrupeds, and those that used only two, bipeds. As the nearly 50-million-year-long Triassic period progressed into the Jurassic, with its own 50-million-year-long time interval, 
they found that the saurians diversified into a far larger number of species and shapes, and absolutely bigger in size, one measure of disparity, than did the mammal-like reptiles. While paleontologists long intuited this by perusing collections, here were numbers for the first time to substantiate this. Their study also confirmed that the saurian grew faster, reaching adulthood and large size faster than did the other group. This time-to-breeding difference might be the most important metric of all. Faster growth and breeding meant that the saurians quickly adapted to the ecological roles of large herbivores and big predators before the smaller, slower-growing therapsids had a chance to evolve into these anatomical forms and ecological niches. Questions remain. During the late Triassic, when dinosaurs were well-established, it would be expected that they would have immediately grown large, Jurassic large, and would have been common as well. According to Chicago paleontologist Paul Serino, who has done more than any other to bring the earliest times of the dinosaur hegemony to light, neither was true. For almost 20 million years, from their first appearance some 221 million years ago until the end of the Triassic about 201 million years ago, dinosaurs and therapsids alike remained both relatively rare and small in size. There may have been more of them than the therapsids during this time, but the overall picture is that neither group was doing very well. Our own take on this is that nothing on land was doing very well at all and that, in fact, it was perhaps far more advantageous for the four-legged land animals to return to the sea, which they did in higher numbers during the Triassic than at any other time in Earth history. The conventional answer for the reason for the Triassic explosion is that the Permian extinction removed so many of the dominant land animals that it opened the way for more innovation than any non-extinction time, or perhaps any other mass extinction time as well. Perhaps as well, it was simply that many terrestrial animal body plans finally came to an evolutionary point of really working efficiently. Even as late as the end of the Permian and into the Triassic, groups as evolutionarily mature as the mammal-like reptiles, the groups Dysonodonts and Cynodonts by this time, were still trying to attain the most efficient kind of upright posture, rather than the less efficient splayed leg orientation of the land reptiles, with all of the ramifications and penalties that this entailed. Body plans were being evolutionarily modified by intense selective pressures, and dominant among these was the need to access sufficient oxygen to feed, breed, and compete in a low-oxygen world. There is an old adage about nothing sharpening the mind faster than imminent death. The same might be said about evolutionary forces when faced with the most pressing of all selective pressures, which was attaining the oxygen necessary for the high levels of animal activity that had been evolutionarily attained in the high oxygen world of the Permian, when nothing was easier to extract from the atmosphere. The two-thirds drop in atmospheric oxygen certainly lit the fuse to an evolutionary bomb, which exploded in the Triassic. Thus, the diversity of Triassic animal plans is analogous to the diversity of marine body plans that resulted from the Cambrian explosion. As we have earlier recounted, the Cambrian explosion followed a mass extinction of the Ediacaran fauna, and it was a time of lower oxygen than today. The latter stimulated much new design. Triassic Rebound The officially designated early Triassic time interval was from 250 to about 245 million years ago, and during this time there is little in the way of recovery from the mass extinction. The oxygen story for the Triassic is stunning. Oxygen dropped to minimal levels of between 10 and 15 percent, and then stayed there for at least 5 million years from 245 to 240 million years ago. There is also a very curious record of large-scale oscillation in carbon isotopes from this time, indicating that the very carbon cycle was being perturbed in what looks like either a succession of methane gas entering the oceans and atmosphere, or a succession of small-scale extinctions taking place. Again, the similarity to the early Cambrian is striking. All evidence certainly paints a picture of a stark and environmentally challenging world for animal life. Microbes may have thrived, especially those that fixed sulfur, but animals had a long period of difficult times. However, difficult times are what best drive the engines of evolution and innovation 
And from this trough in oxygen on planet Earth emerged new kinds of animals, most sporting respiratory systems better able to cope with the extended oxygen crisis. On land, two new groups were to emerge from the wreckage, mammals and dinosaurs. The former would become understudies while the latter would take over the world. As we saw in the last chapter, the Permian extinction annihilated almost all land life. The therapsids were hard hit. Much less is known about the archosauromorphs, reptiles with a somewhat crocodile-like anatomy. For at the end of the Permian, they are a rare and little-seen group in areas such as the Karoo or Russia that have yielded rich deposits with abundant dicynodont, mammal-like reptile, faunas. In the Karoo Desert, at least, very few well-preserved archosauromorphs have come from uppermost Permian study sections worked on by co-authors Word and Kirschfink in the company of South Africa's Roger Smith. If we are still poorly informed about their Permian ancestry, there is no ambiguity about the success of the earliest Triassic archosauromorphs. In the Karoo, in only a few meters of the strata that seem to mark the transition from Permian to Triassic, there are relatively common remains of a fairly large reptile, known as Proterosuchus, also known as Castatosaurus. This was definitely a land animal with a very impressive set of sharply pointed teeth. It was also definitely a predator, but like those of a crocodile, its legs were splayed to the sides, if somewhat more upright than the crocodilian condition. But this condition was to rapidly change in the archosauromorphs to a more upright orientation as the Triassic progressed, and more gracile and rapid predators soon replaced the early archosauromorphs, such as Proterosuchus. While the need for speed was surely a driver toward this better locomotor posture, just as important may have been the need to be able to breathe while walking. Like a lizard, Proterosuchus may still have had a back-and-forth sway to its body as it walked. And, as we have seen previously, this sort of locomotion causes compression on the lung area due to what is known as carrier's constraint. The concept that quadrupeds with splayed-out legs cannot breathe while they run because their sinuous side-to-side -side swaying of the body impinges on the lungs and ribcage, inhibiting inspiration. For this reason, lizards and salamanders cannot breathe while walking, and Proterosuchus may have had something of this effect although not as pronounced as in modern-day salamanders or lizards. A solution is to put the legs beneath, but this is only a partial solution. To truly be free of the constraint that breathing put on posture, extensive modification to the respiratory system as well as the locomotor system had to be made. The lineage that led to dinosaurs and birds found an effective and novel adaptation to overcome this breathing problem. Bipedalism. By removing the quadruped stance, they were freed of the constraints of motion and lung function. The ancestors of the mammals also made new innovations, including a secondary palate, which allows simultaneous eating and breathing, as well as a complete upright but still quadruped stance. But this was still not satisfactory, and a new kind of breathing system evolved. A powerful set of muscles known as the diaphragm allowed a much more forceful system for inspiring and then exhaling air. There are other clues than dinosaur bones to the nature of life on Earth and the challenges it faced during the low oxygen times of the Triassic. Part of the Triassic explosion was a diversification of reptiles returning to the sea. Many separate lineages did this, and the reasons why this happened may be tied up in the problems posed by the hot, low oxygen Triassic world. Oxygen is necessary to run metabolic reactions in animals. It enables the chemical reactions that are life itself. But as in a chemistry experiment, several factors control the reactions themselves. One of the most important is temperature. Metabolic rate is the pace at which energy is used by an organism. It is far higher in endotherms than in ectoderms. But even in the same organism, the metabolic rate is directly and importantly influenced by temperature to a surprising degree. Recent studies have shown that as much as one-third to one-half of all energy expenditure by an animal is used for simply staying alive through activities such as protein turnover, ion pumping, blood circulation, and breathing. Other required activities such as movement, reproduction, feeding, and other behavior come on top of this and the rate that fuel is used goes up with rising temperature. 
But as metabolic rate goes up, so too does the need for oxygen, for the chemical reactions of life are oxygen-dependent. The key finding is that metabolic rates double to triple with each 10-degree rise in temperature. The consequences of this in a world that has less oxygen availability than now but warmer average temperatures would be major. There is no direct link between oxygen levels in the atmosphere and temperature, but there is a direct link between temperature and CO2, the well-known greenhouse effect. As we saw in Chapter 3, levels of oxygen and atmospheric CO2 are roughly inverse. When oxygen is high, CO2 is low, and the converse. Many periods in the past with low oxygen had high CO2, and thus were hot. In a low O2 world that is hot, the animal loses. We have already seen many solutions to dealing with low oxygen. One of them is obviously the simple solution of staying cool. Some solutions to staying cool or cool enough are physiological. Some are behavioral. One of these is all at once morphological, physiological, and behavioral. It is to return to the sea, the cool sea, for even in the hottest world of the past, the ocean would be essentially cooler in terms of physiology. And for this reason, perhaps, many Mesozoic land animals traded feet for flippers or fins and returned to the sea at a prodigious rate. As noted earlier in this chapter, in this time of higher global temperature, perhaps 30 degrees Fahrenheit warmer, in fact, on a global average, and only half the atmospheric oxygen found today, an increasing proportion of tetrapod diversity was composed of animals that re-evolved a marine lifestyle. Never before and never since have so many lineages given up the land for the sea. Today, we celebrate the many kinds of whale, seal, and penguin families, the three groups coming from land dwellers that now show the greatest marine adaptations. Yet whales and seals combined make up only 2% of all mammal genera, and penguins but 1% of birds. But the Triassic Oceans had many more kinds of such changed creatures, animals adapted to land that had revolved a body plan for life in the sea. In the Triassic, there were giant ichthyosaurs, as well as seagoing tetrapods, such as placodonts. The latter were like large seals, but unlike seals, had blunt teeth expressly evolved to crack shellfish. In the Jurassic, the ichthyosaurs remained, and were joined by a host of long or short-necked pliosaurs. And in the Cretaceous, the ichthyosaurs disappeared to be replaced by large mosasaurs. But all had a common theme, back to the ocean. The existence of so many marine tetrapods was confirmed with the important research of marine reptile expert Natalie Bardet, who in 1994 published a review of all known marine reptile families of the Mesozoic. The surprise was that proportionately there were so many in the Triassic period. But why would so many animals evolve a marine lifestyle? The two dominant environmental factors of those days would have been the low oxygen and the high global temperature of our planet. Ray Huey, a reptile specialist at the University of Washington, suggested, too, that the high heat of the early Triassic through Jurassic would have been an evolutionary incentive for some number of reptiles to go back into the sea. In fact, in 2006, co-author Ward showed that there was a very interesting and inverse correlation between Mesozoic oxygen levels and the number of marine reptiles. When oxygen was low, the percentage of marine reptiles was high. But as oxygen rose, the proportion of tetrapod families fully aquatic markedly dropped. This may not be that the absolute number of marine forms decreased as much as it was that the number of terrestrial dinosaurs markedly increased. Yet it marks an unusual and new view of the greenhouse planet that was Mesozoic Earth. Triassic-Jurassic Mass Extinction One of the striking new findings of the oxygen through time results has been the level of Triassic oxygen. Only several years ago, the minimum oxygen levels of the past 300 million years was rather universally pegged at the Permian-Triassic boundary of 252 million years ago. But that time of oxygen low has been substantially moved, and now may correspond much more closely to the Triassic-Jurassic, TJ boundary, of 200 million years ago than previously thought. Thus, rather than the Triassic being a time of oxygen rise, or even a time with two downturns, one at the end of the Permian, 
one at the end of the Triassic, we are confronted with the possibility that oxygen was lower in the late Triassic than in the early part of the period, perhaps as low as 10% of the atmosphere at sea level, or about half the modern-day levels. This time corresponds to one of the major changes of the Triassic, the winnowing out of most land vertebrates, with the exception of the first dinosaurs. The cause of this mass extinction, like the others, has been long debated. What is clear is that, like the Permian mass extinction, the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction occurred in a dead heat, literally and figuratively, with the emplacement of one of the largest flood basalt episodes in the history of Earth, one second only to the Siberian Traps event of the late Permian. Back-to-back -back mass extinctions, 50 million years apart, both temporally linked to large flood basalts, Events well known to rapidly increase carbon dioxide levels in both air and sea to many times the starting values. Some estimates place the peak CO2 levels in the atmosphere as from 2,000 to 3,000 parts per million, compared to our own 400, 2014 parts per million, but rising fast. The utter destruction of plant life makes a dent in the carbon cycle and changes the relative proportion of carbon-12 to carbon-13. The use of this comparison, the carbon isotope analysis discussed at many other points in this book, seems to be a fixture of the mass extinctions. But it was not until a report by Ward and others in 2001, from TJ Interval Strata nestled along a shoreline fronting an old-growth, cold-temperature rainforest located on one of British Columbia's Queen Charlotte Islands, that this carbon isotope perturbation was found. Just as with the Devonian and Permian greenhouse extinction before it, the newly found signal is characterized by oscillating changes in the ratio of C13 to C12, brought about by changes in the abundance, kind, and burial history of diverse kinds of life on the planet. As for the Devonian and Permian events, this signal seemed to indicate that this extinction, as well as the others, were caused by something other than impact. The conclusion that the TJ was yet another in the family of greenhouse extinctions was briefly challenged by another kind of discovery soon after the first carbon isotope shift was reported on. Paul Olson of Columbia University and colleagues announced to great press effect that the TJ was caused, in fact, by large body impact with the Earth. This seemed to provide a nice symmetry, an asteroid ending the age of dinosaurs and another, 135 million years earlier, seemingly started that same age of dinosaurs. Or so it seemed. Olson's evidence of impact had been found at a site in the Newark, New Jersey region, home to the most diverse assemblage of late Triassic and early Jurassic dinosaur footprints on the planet. It was the association of dinosaurs and mass death that whetted the journalist's appetite for extensive press coverage. Olson and his colleagues reported an iridium anomaly from continental TJ boundary beds in New Jersey. It was just such an anomaly that had first alerted the Alvarez team, in 1980, to the possibility of impact at the end of the Cretaceous. Iridium had become the gold standard of impact evidence. But here, the two studies wildly diverged. Where the Alvarez group followed the physical and geochemical evidence from their Italian boundary section with data confirming mass extinction of small ocean life at the same time as the impact, the Olson paper for the Triassic event followed their physical and geochemical evidence with just the opposite. They found that rather than eliminating most life in their section, instead the impact seemed to have acted like a biotic fertilizer, leading to both more and bigger life. The Olson group was sampling strata deposited on land, or more correctly, in streams and shallow lakes on land, and the fossils they studied were footprints, not the remains of body parts. But in spite of these rather startling differences, the Olson et al. conclusion was the same, that a great asteroid had hit the Earth, this time about 200 million years ago, the age of the Triassic-Jurassic boundary, and that like the KT event, the dinosaurs were affected but the argument was that the impact killed off competitors of the dinosaurs, leading to a rise in diversity and animal size. And unlike the secrecy surrounding Luann Becker's work and methods dealing with the Permian extinction, Paul Olson brought all who cared to look to his urban outcrops. Plenty of the many specialists working on mass extinctions at the time made the trip. Olson's samples had yielded iridium 
and unlike the Becker work, various labs confirmed his findings. But a finding of iridium alone may not have propelled this work into science, the prestigious flagship of scientific publishing. Olson and his colleagues had pulled another and totally different array of evidence out of their New Jersey rocks. At numerous outcrops equal in age to that yielding the iridium, Olson and crew had noticed that a significant change was observable among the footprints. The beautiful three-toed footprints known to residents of this area for more than two centuries increased in number, size, and diversity of shape. One would think that the footprints found in strata deposited after the T.J. mass extinction would be fewer in number, number of animals around, fewer in kind, a lesser species diversity, and smaller in size since one lesson that we do know from the asteroid-caused KT extinction is that it was disproportionately lethal to larger-sized animals. While no dinosaur or any of the many kinds of reptiles and mammal-like reptiles matched size with the biggest dinosaurs going extinct at the end of the Cretaceous, many were equal in size to dinosaurs that did go extinct as a result of the KT asteroid. Thus, fewer Fewer kinds of and smaller-sized footprints would be expected in earliest Jurassic rocks if the Triassic's end was caused by an impact. Yet just the opposite was observed in all three of these evidence lines. There were more footprints of more different kinds, and many were larger, much larger, than the largest of the Triassic footprints. It was this evidence as much as the iridium finding that convinced science that this research article was important enough to publish in their journal. Just as in the case of Luann Becker's work of a year prior to Olson's publication, the science paper by Olson et al. was scrutinized in painstaking detail. Two experts on interpreting impact deposits, Frank Kite of UCLA and David Kring of Arizona, were both of the opinion that the iridium finding was certainly indicative of an impact about that time. Both also pointed out that the amount of iridium reported from the various sites of the Olson group was at least an order of magnitude less than that found at virtually every KT boundary site. Something fell to earth all right, but it was small, probably too small to cause the amount of extinction at the end of the Triassic. Thus, while evidence for impact at the end of the Triassic was much more believable than at the end of the Permian, it was still hard to believe, based on this new evidence, that the Triassic extinction was a KT-like impact extinction. There is indeed a large crater in Quebec. It is one of the biggest craters visible on the planet, named Manicouagou Crater, with a diameter of about 100 kilometers. In comparison, the Chicxulub Crater is 180 to 200 kilometers in diameter. It had long been thought to be of the right age, too, somewhere near 210 million years in age, which was about the age of the Triassic-Jurassic boundary. The radioactive decay measures indicated that the Triassic came to an end about 199 million years ago. In 2005, this date was slightly changed to 201 million years ago. And not only did the TJ get younger, but the age of the Manicouagan crater got older. Better dating placed its age at 214 million years ago. Our own work on the Queen Charlotte Islands was designed to look at the TJ extinction, but also to search for any possible fossil die-off prior to it, in rocks we could age as being around 214 million years in age. The kill curve estimates of the late 20th century predicted that any impact event leaving a crater the size of Manicouagan would easily kill off between a quarter and third of all species on Earth. And we found nothing. Perhaps we have overestimated the lethality of asteroid impacts? Triassic Blackness By the early years of the new century, Geochemist Robert Berner of Yale University had greatly increased the resolution of his complicated computer models that estimated the amount of oxygen and carbon dioxide for any 10 million year interval of the past 560 million years. His results showed a startling match between the times of lowest oxygen levels, or the most rapidly dropping oxygen levels, and mass extinction events. All three of the mass extinction events with problematical causes showed strata indicating deposition in low oxygen conditions. Under such circumstances, strata usually turn black, 
because they contain the mineral pyrite and other sulfur compounds that are said to be reduced and that they were produced by chemical reactions that can occur only in the absence of oxygen. A second clue came from the fact that the rocks of these ages were thinly bedded or even laminated, often showing delicate sedimentary structures with the strata. Because so many animals burrow, most strata deposited in the sea since the Cambrian are what is called bioturbated by the vast number of invertebrates that ingest sediment at the bottom of a body of water in order to strain out any organic material. The presence of the fine bedding could occur only in environments with no or only rare animals. Through these three avenues, modeling, rock mineralogy, dictating color, and sedimentary bedding, it was clear that the Permian, Triassic, and Paleocene extinctions took place in a low oxygen world. Other evidence, discovered in the late 1990s and early part of the new century, showed that while oxygen may have been low, another constituent of the Earth's atmosphere was at the same time high, carbon dioxide. Like the evidence for low oxygen, the CO2 evidence came from Berner's models as well as from evidence preserved in the rock record, or more accurately in this case, in the fossil record. Unfortunately, there is no way of actually measuring the exact volume of CO2 that was present at any time in the past. Carbon dioxide does not color rocks or affect bedding. But some very clever work on fossil leaves resulted in an important breakthrough that allowed a relative measure of CO2. Using this method, for instance, a paleobotanist could determine whether carbon dioxide levels were rising, falling, or staying the same over million-year intervals. And furthermore, the method allowed estimates on how many times higher or lower the levels were from some base-level observation. The CO2 measure turns out to be both clever and simple, as so often it turns out with wonderful breakthroughs. Botanists looking at modern-day plant leaves had done experiments in which they grew plant species in closed systems, where the amount of CO2 could be raised or lowered relative to the level found in our atmosphere about 360 parts per million when these experiments were first conducted. Plants, it turns out, are highly sensitive to carbon dioxide levels, since even the small amounts of CO2 in the atmosphere must serve as the source for their carbon, the major building block of life. They acquire this mainly in their leaves through tiny portals to the outside world called stomata. When grown in high levels of CO2, the plants produced a small number of stomata, as even just a few sufficed in high CO2 levels. The investigator then eagerly turned to the fossil record. Leaf stomata are readily observable in leaf fossils. The results confirmed Bob Berner's model results. At the end of the Permian and during the early Triassic, the fossil leaves showed only a few stomata. Carbon dioxide was spectacularly high at all three times. Moreover, not only was it high, but the rise in CO2 happened quickly on the order of thousands, not millions, of years. These two results gave an entirely new view of mass extinctions. Each occurred in a world quickly warmed by the short-term rise in carbon dioxide, and perhaps methane as well, based on yet another line of evidence. And in addition to being hot, it was a place also low in oxygen. High temperature, low oxygen conditions coincided with major mass extinction. While modern-day greenhouses are not places of low oxygen, just the opposite by photosynthesis, they are places that heat very quickly due to the greenhouse properties of the glass panes covering the whole structure. Sunlight comes through the window panes, but when sunlight is radiated back in the form of light waves and heat, the glass panes trap the energy, which then warms the air, much like carbon dioxide, methane, and water vapor molecules do. Heat is dangerous to any animal. The highest temperature that any animal can withstand is not even halfway to the temperature that boils water. At 40 degrees Celsius, most animals die off, and the last holdouts die at 45 degrees Celsius. As is all too tragically known from the many sad cases of kids left in cars on a sunny day, rapid heating can be lethal. And the two aspects of this physiological system the amount of oxygen available, and the amount of heat energy, combine to make things even more lethal. Animals need more oxygen as heat increases. Of the three extinctions, the data for the Triassic-Jurassic CO2 rise is particularly stunning. University of Chicago paleobotanist Jenny McElwain 
collecting rocks in the dangerous and frigid outcrops amid the ice of Greenland in the last years of the 20th century, showed without doubt that the end of the Triassic was ushered in by a sudden rise in CO2 in an already low oxygen world. Increasingly, the Triassic began to look like an event similar to that at the end of the Permian. What it did not look like was the KT extinction event, in which the extinctions were sudden and spread across every animal and plant group. But it was as if none of them saw it coming from an ecological or evolutionary sense. At the end of the Triassic, on the other hand, every group except the Sariscian dinosaurs were undergoing size reduction, or at best maintaining roughly equal diversity in the time intervals leading up to and after the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, as if they knew bad times were coming and small size would be more adaptive. The groups with the simplest lungs, amphibians and the early evolved reptiles, fared the worst, and many groups that had been very successful early in the Triassic, such as phytosaurs, underwent complete extinction. Both amphibians and archosauromorphs probably had very simple lungs inflated by rib musculature only. Mammals and advanced therapsids of this time, probably both having diaphragm-inflated lungs, did better. But crocodiles, presumably with abdominal pumps, did poorly. The success of the Sariscians may have been due to a multitude of factors. Food acquisition, temperature tolerance, avoidance of predators, reproductive success. But our conclusion is that this group was unique in possessing a highly septate lung, one with many tiny flaps to increase surface area, that was more efficient than the lungs of any other lineage, and that in the very low oxygen world that occurred both before and after the Triassic-Jurassic mass extinction, this respiratory system conveyed great competitive advantages. Under this scenario, the Sariscian dinosaurs took over the Earth at the end of the Triassic, and maintained that dominance well into the Jurassic because of superior activity levels. We now know that alone among the many kinds of reptilian body plans of the mid to late Triassic, the Sariscian dinosaurs diversified in the face of either static or more commonly falling numbers in the other groups. We also know that oxygen reached its lowest levels of the past 500 million years in the late Triassic. Something about Sariscians enhanced their survival in a low-oxygen world. The ground truth suggests that a long and slow drop in oxygen culminated in the Triassic mass extinction, but that this extinction was really a double event, separated by a range of three to seven million years. There are few places on land where this time interval with abundant vertebrate fossils can be found. We really do not know the pattern of vertebrate extinction as well as we do the extinction in the sea. We do not know how rapidly the prominent victims of the mass extinction, the phytosaurs, aetosaurs, primitive archosauromorphs, tridolodont therapsids, and other large animals disappeared. But by the time the gaudy Jurassic ammonites appeared in the seas in abundance, leaving behind an exuberant record of renewal in early Jurassic rocks, the dinosaurs had won the world. What kind of lungs did they have? There is no certainty but one. They had lungs and a respiratory system that could deal with the greatest oxygen crisis the world was to know in the time of animals on Earth. A new view of things is that Sariscian dinosaurs had a lower extinction rate than any other terrestrial vertebrate group because of a competitively superior respiration system, the first air sac system. The fact that Sariscians were actually expanding in number across this mass extinction boundary is the most striking aspect of all.